All right. Thanks, Daniel. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me for this Node 2021 Lightning Talk. My name is Sam Chauvet, and I'm a senior consultant with uh, Graphable Inc. And today we'll be looking at application driven graph architecture. So, as you all know, schema, uh, Neo4j is schemaless, and that presents many advantages. It's extremely flexible, allows for rapid iterations during development and evolution over time as an application needs change changes. But the difficulty can arise when all these changes happen really fast and the developer needs to keep up. Uh, changes to the schema can potentially break everything on the API side. And over time, what we've noticed is that uh, a large number of clients start this with no naming conventions in place, no rules, and this can lead to everyone kind of spinning their wheels, trying to keep up with the changes instead of progressing and implementing uh, new features. Some examples of this that we've we've seen is uh, Joe the Undecided, who often renames properties. He'll change date to start date, and that means that in the back end, I, the developer, need to go and update all my properties. And then two weeks later, he'll change his mind and change it to start timestamp instead of start date. And again, I need to go update that. And it makes it hard for me to be friends with Joe. Uh, we also have Ted the Improver, who wants to move all the address properties off the nodes into a place node since they could be shared. And this makes complete sense. We want to do this, but that means that now I have to go through all my code and change all my queries to make sure that that, that happens. Sometimes I also get comments at 6 a.m. Like, why haven't you sent back all the new properties that we just added last night? Or why is this property always re returning a null? That one's on me usually because it's a misspelling. Uh, there are also situations where suddenly we need to collect all the nodes when we want to return them because now it's a one-to-many relationship instead of a one-to-one. -one. So I end up finding myself continuously reworking queries and spending a lot of time doing that. So what we want, the solution we want to end up with is kind of in between a GraphQL where the onus is on the front end and where everything is hard coded. We want to essentially have uh, APIs that we use the maximum amount of, of code and of queries. So we want everything to be kind of standardized. So our goal with this is to create a functional graph schema that's generic enough to facilitate iterations of development uh, also easy enough to set up new API endpoints or edit existing ones and maximize the number of non-breaking changes that can be made to the graph schema so that we can just continue without breaking things. Uh, we also want to return all of our data <clears throat> in an easy standardized, uh, an easy to use, easy to understand standardized format and maximize uh, our generic code. Then what ends up happening is that our schema becomes self-documenting. And we'll look at what that means a little later on. And it defines the API contract. And for using that, the developer can just take a look at the schema, the front end or any of the developers, and understand what objects are going to be returned, what the endpoints look like, et cetera. So today we'll go over some naming conventions, some API rules that'll, that'll help us keep all this in place. And then we'll look at a few examples. So for the naming conventions on the graph schema side, there are just a couple um, a couple rules that we want to follow. We want to start with a verb for all our relationships. We want to have the relationships contain the name of the node that they point to. So in this case, we can see that our verb is at, and it points to a film location node. And so our, our, our relationship name is at film underscore location. And then we want to start every uh, every relationship rule with a has if it's pointing to, if it's a one-to-many relationship. So this scene, for example, can, can have multiple actors, and so that's going to be has, and then the name of the node, actors. And then anything else that's not a has is going to be a one-to-one. -one. And this is going to really help us understand the relationships down the road. We'll look at that. Uh, and then the only other rules that we have are on the properties. We try to have anything that's a date, 
needs to end up with underscore date and so that, that we know that that's what that is. On the API side, uh, the rules that we've defined are going to be that each API endpoint is going to be the node alias, which is essentially the node label just underscored. So again, we're looking at film location, it becomes the endpoint becomes film underscore location. And the endpoints are going to return all of that uh, node's properties. And they're also going to return all of the outgoing child nodes. So if it's if the child node is uh, connected by a has relationship, it'll be returned as a list of objects. <clears throat> or if it's just a one-to-one, -one, it'll be an object. And we're going to use the relationship name as our key for those objects. Uh, we're not going to do any typecasting on the back end. We're not going to check for existing properties. We're just going to turn exactly what's in the database. And this avoids, this avoids issues with property name changes. Now I don't need to go and update all of those in all my queries. <clears throat> I'm just returning them all regardless. Uh, it, it, it avoids uh, property type changes. I'm not worrying about any of the types. And it uh, also allows any new properties that are just added are automatically be re returned because we're returning all properties. And we also avoid returning null for non-existent or misspelled properties. Um, so let's take a look at uh, one of our uh, schemas. So off, right off the bat, because of our rules that we've already established, we can, we can determine what the name of the endpoints for each of these nodes are going to be. And we also know what that endpoint is going to return. Uh, in this case, we know that movie is going to be the movie endpoint. It's going to return a studio object because it's an at. It's going to return a company object because it's a, a, comp it's a for. And it's going to return a list of objects because it can have multiple scenes. Uh, has actor also will be each scene can have multiple actors. So we know all this information because of our rules for the schema. And we know what it's going to return because of our rules on the API. And this just makes it really easy for anyone to come and look and see what they what what they want and see where they need to get it from. Uh, it also on the back end allows me to write super generic queries like match this movie and then optionally match any outgoing relationship. And if it's a has, return it as a list of objects. So that allows us to gener have generic endpoints that reuse uh, reuse code as, as most as possible. Uh, for an example, for the for the, the Git example here, we're going to pass in the UID. And so in this case, uh, the front end knows everything he needs to know about the schema on the back end because of the payload that's returned. He knows that by calling this specific movie, he's going to get all the properties. He's also going to get, because it's a list of properties, a list of objects here, he knows that scene is a one to many, uh, and he knows that uh, this this movie has a single relationship to a studio, and a single relationship to company, and he knows what these relationships are named. So based on our payload here, the front end developer can even know what the schema is on the back end. And uh, for the the only other rules that we have. Uh, for the API are going to be in our, our updating or creating new uh, new nodes. What we want to do here is we want to say that if the payload that the front-end developer sends to the back-end, if it contains a UUID, then we know that we're matching that node. If it doesn't contain a UUID, then we know that we're creating a new node with that. Uh, we know that the node, what the node label needs to be based on the relationship or based on the endpoint, if it's at the top level. Uh, in this case, if he's calling scene, we'll know that he's create or he's looking for this scene or updating this scene. If it didn't include a UID, we would know that he's trying to create this scene. Um, and then the other rule that we have is that if we set any, any property that's passed, we'll get updated. So if he doesn't pass any properties, we won't do any updating to that node. And any uh, non-has relationships, so any other relationship that's an object, we're going to detach those so that we can 
attach the new relationship that's passed. So in this case, he might be trying to attach a new film location to this scene. And so we're going to detach any other existing film locations, uh, or it should be just one, and attach this one. And that's that's basically it. Based on those rules, now on the on the put side, again, it's just a really simple uh, simple chunk of code that can handle any and all of our needs for updating the the graph. Um, and those those are all the rules and conventions. Uh, they allow us to predict the schema based on the payloads, and then conversely, they allow us to predict the payload based on the schema, and we're able to use uh, the same code for the majority of our endpoints, and we avoid breaking the API with most of our schema changes. That's that's all I have for today, and I'll pass it back to Daniel. We'll have some questions, I guess, at the end. Thanks.